We're back. We're live. We're at 10 o'clock rock here on a given Wednesday after a given Tuesday, which was, of course, yesterday. That is, um, what, August 16th. Oh, the Hawaii Clean, clean energy, energy Day. Day. Sharon, it was fabulous. That's well, Sharon Moriwaki, my co-host here. Morning, good morning. Yeah. And we are honored to have Chair Randy Iwase. Let me tell you a little about him. He's the chair of the PUC. He was appointed to chair of the PUC in January 2015. He was named chair by, of the commission by Governor David Ige for a term to expire on June 30th, 2020. So he has plenty of time to change the world, right? <laughs> um, before his appointment to the commission, Chair Iwase served as the chair of the Hawaii State Tax Review and chair of the Hawaii Labor and Industrial Relations Appeals Board. He also served as the supervising deputy attorney general, uh, where his division provided legal counsel to the Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs and the Public Utilities Commission. Chair Iwase is a former state senator and a former Honolulu City Council member. He holds a JD from the University of San Francisco School of Law and a BA from the University of Florida, Gainesville, where he graduated with honors. I'm, I'm reading from the, uh, the PUC uh, website, and there's a picture of him, which doesn't look entirely like him, <laughs> but it's close enough. <laughs> and also, I want to mention, this is very important, that he ran for governor of the state of Hawaii in 2006. Am I right? That's correct. Welcome to our show. We are honored to have you, Chair Iwasa. We are. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, Welcome. Sharon. And thanks for speaking yesterday. Can you summarize your remarks at Clean Energy Day? Well, it was just a brief uh, recapping of what um, has been happening at the PUC at an operational level. We've increased staffing from 32 to 55. Um, mm -hmm. Staffing is critical. I've been in government now for 34 years, and you know, commissioners like me, uh, we're like leaves in the wind. We come and go. And, uh, but the staff, they, pro they provide the continuity. They provide the expertise. Mm -hmm. They provide, and the people we've hired uh, are very energized, very committed, and um, I'm very pleased that we've, with what we've gotten so far, uh, we have room for ten, uh, five, uh, 10 more people. And uh, they have... So if you're interested, contact the PUC. Yeah, uh, yes. And you have space for them now? Yeah. No, oh, no. Oh. We, have to, we have to wait. We, we fill up the space. So, um, but it was critical because we had the merger case coming on. We had the, what I call the four major dockets, demand response, uh, distributive energy resource, the power supply improvement plan, and uh, the decoupling uh, dockets. As I said yesterday, um, uh, the Mixera merger case sucked all the window um, air out of the room. People, because it was, it was the case that everyone wanted to know about. But lurking there, just as important, and in my view, more important, uh, were these four dockets. Because the Nextera case was about who would be operating the utility, but not where they're going to go. These four cases set out the blueprint, the, the, the pathway. And whoever runs the utility, mm -hmm will uh, have to travel th those pathways. And these, these four dockets, which are very major, involving the utility, involving stakeholders from across the community. Um, and that's what we're working on now. Does that mean you're working on modeling or remodeling the utility? No, no. Um, you know, for example, PSIP, which is quite critical for us, it, it's asking the utility, you tell us um, how you are going to uh, implement um, programs and initiatives so we can get to uh, the cl uh, clean uh, energy goals that we've set. Um, what, uh, uh, what kind of capital projects you're going to be looking at? What are your long-term goals? And it sets, it sets a framework from which um, we can look at submissions over, the, say, the next five years from the electric company. Uh, to determine whether or not these are initiatives that should proceed or should not proceed. So it's, a, it's a, in, in many ways a collaborative effort because, and, and that's a much overused word, um, collaborative does not mean you don't disagree. It does not mean you don't sometimes don't disagree greatly. But it's, it's a process that has been in the works, and it's, it, we get input from the uh, stakeholders. Uh, Hawaiian Electric has to hear it. Uh, we hear from Hawaiian Electric. We kind of manage this process. We will be issuing a PSIP order again within the next week or two, hopefully within the next week, mm -hmm. and hopefully looking at a final PSIP order sometime in, in uh, early January or late uh, early February of next year, late January or early February of next year. So 
um, it's not so much dictating. It's be because this field of ours, this thing called energy sustainability, it's ever-changing, it's evolving, and so it's important that we involve everyone in the process. And for the community, just um, what is the power of PSIP? What is it generally, the power supply plan? What does that entail? That's what, that's what uh, we are working on now. It's asking the utility company, how are you going to get there? So the how are you going to, how are you going, how are you, what, are you, what are you going to do about smart metering? What are you going to do? Uh, um, uh, they had put in, for example, uh, in the PSIP, heavy reliance on LNG. Okay, if that's not going to be the a, a transition fuel, what will you be doing? Um, what kind of cost are we looking at? Provide an analysis to us of what you would want to do so that we can look at it to determine whether or not this is a good path to follow, whether it is cost effective, whether it, whether it will provide uh, energy efficiency, safety, and reliability. And um, it's been an ongoing process. It's not easy. It's not going to be uh, finished, like I said. When I say we end the PISIP docket in uh, uh, February of 2017, it means that we move on to another uh, uh, a situation or station, so to speak, and, and figure out, okay, further, how are we going to go? Mm -hmm. Strikes me that in the past, before your time on the commission, in fact, maybe, maybe years before your time on the commission, the commission was not active like this. This is activity. This is action points. Um, what you're saying is we got a goal here. Uh, we want you to you, you do it. We want you to tell us how you're going to do it. And then we're going to comment on that. We're going to approve it, disapprove it. We're going to modify it. Yes. Um, do you ever call them in the room privately? Not say privately, but you know, out of a formal hearing, right? <laughs> I, I know you have the power to do that um, and say, look, let's talk. Is that possible? Well, that's why we have uh, in these dockets uh, what's called technical conferences. Yeah. Uh, we bring everyone into the room. Yeah. So that um, everyone hears what everyone else is saying. I don't think, um, let me add this. I don't think with so many uh, parties involved, the, the word consensus is an operative word. Because when you have, uh, you got three people in a room, you're gonna have three different opinions. You, you add 20, and obviously you're gonna have very divergent views. And so ultimately it's gonna rest upon the PUC to look at all that has come in and uh, to uh, make decisions of what should be done what, and, and where we should be going. Uh, Part of the, the, the uh, everyone refers to now what the PUC issued about two years ago, I believe it was, the, the, the white paper called Inclinations, which sets forth the PUC's vision of what Hawaii's energy world should look like, was in response to um, um, plans which were filed by the utility company, which were not satisfactory to the PUC. And so the response was, hey, look, we, we don't agree with what you're doing. We don't agree with uh, what you're saying. And so let us suggest to you where, uh, what might be a better path. Let us suggest to you uh, things like, what should a 21st century utility be? Should we be looking at top down, you produce the energy, you do transmission, you do distribution? Should we look at a, a utility of the future where um, you maybe do the generation and somebody else does transmission? Is it possible? We don't know. Uh, who should own the utility? Um, should it be, um, and, and that'll come to us in a separate docket, of course. Is it in a separate docket now? No, because we just finished one called Nextera. Yeah. Because that process means for that to occur, you'd have to go to the, what Nextera did. You go to the shareholders, for first you get the board approval, go to the shareholders, you get agreement, okay, we want to merge and, and get ac acquired, and so we're going to file a docket. Anyone who now wants to, uh, uh, acquire or control Hawaiian Electric would have to go through the same process. Yeah, so, um, th and this might happen. There yes, might be somebody could. else out there in the wings, although I, I expect Wall Street is a little bit skittish after this But in one. the meantime, he goes, keeps going forward with what you're saying, yeah. and so you don't stop that process. I mean, is, is this, can we, I, I, I don't know how far you can go in your comments, but is this something that we should expect that there will be uh, a change, uh, you know, a dramatic uh, ownership change or model change in the utility going forward? I can't, on the ownership, uh, I, I, can't, I can't comment on that because we don't know. 
uh, I just I don't do want to comment on on what your comment on Wall Street. If you look at you know there were a lot of doomsday uh, speakers about oh you know if we do not approve Nextera, uh, the world will collapse. Uh, I, I, that's hyperbole on my part, but that's how I took it. Well, when the decision was issued, uh, the HECO stocks did not collapse. Uh, HECO did not come to a screeching halt. In fact, the stocks uh, are maintaining their level that they were uh, prior to uh, the offer being made. In fact, it's even better, I think, it's on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so is HECO an attractive uh, company? I, would, I leave it up to those who might want to acquire it. What we did do in our over 400-page decision in the next Terra case, uh, we set out a 17-page document called guidance, which was a guidance. And we said any future uh, suitor for Hawaiian Electric, these are the areas of concern for the PUC. These are the areas we want you to address. And if you don't address them successfully, uh, then we are going to have a hard time approving any kind of merger acquisition. Fair enough. I, I, what, I, what I hear you saying is you, you're having a conversation with them. You're telling them your view of the 21st century utility. In the um, PSIP. Yeah. And, and right. another it's, it's, it's a conversation in writing, but it's a conversation. Right. Yeah. yeah, and it's um, where should we be going? Yeah. Um, and the inclinations strongly hinted at certain things. One, we want to meet the renewable energy goals. Uh, that is the policy of the legislature. I was in the legislature. Uh, I am not an expert in the utility field. I am, however, comfortable to say here today that I have some knowledge about making policy and executing on policy and what it takes to get from here to there. Um, and so we're going to push that. And um, so in the dockets itself, uh, we're, we're, we're having this common diversity of renewables, um, not just PVs on roof. It's an important aspect. The public has to understand that there are other types of renewables that we have to engage in. Um, I heard yesterday, well, I didn't hear yesterday, but I, I hear and I agree with, with some of the uh, concerns about looking going forward. Um, we've, we've hit the low-hanging fruit. Uh, it's going to be more difficult. That is true. But what I, I would want people to say, uh, think also in a more optimistic view is you, you, we should not be judging where we're going to be in 45 years viewed from the technology of today. That is, that, if you looked at what we have today, let's say 100 years ago, we'd probably be saying we can't, uh, we will not have a car going, or we will not have hydrogen cars because all we got is the Model T. And we're not going to go beyond the Model T. We, I am sure, with the money that's being plowed into the energy field now, with the brain power we have out there, not just in America. I mean, we have other countries that are engaged in, in developing renewable, uh, renewable energy industry. That somebody out there uh, who's probably in high school is going to, I'm confident, will, will develop something that will improve batteries, will find a new source of collecting energy and distributing energy. And so when you're looking out 30 years from now, which is 2045, I feel very confident that we're going to get there. Yeah. Uh, we, we went from zero to the moon in, uh, in eight years yeah. uh, with John Kennedy uh, with, with, a, with a space program, with a space capsule that I understand had probably less electronic and computer power in it than a toaster oven today. <laughs> you know, so much can happen. Yeah, and, and that's the thing, you know, it's the old story. We can't anticipate the fabulous things that are going to happen in technology. That's right. But that doesn't mean we would sit around on our hands waiting for that to happen right. because you can, never, you can never achieve anything that way. You're always waiting because it's always moving. That's right. So how do you deal with that? Well, one thing is, I've, I said it when I first came onto the PUC, the hardest thing is to say this is the only way you're going to go. This is the only technology you would use because you might be wrong in five years. So it's how, and somebody used this analogy, it's like a platform. What we create is a platform for people to put their stuff on and we see what can we use. Yeah. Um, encouraging uh, new, new ideas, uh, not, not dissing it or dismissing it. The, the Mirai, the Toyota Mirai, the hydrogen car, is it in fact a viable option to the electric car? And uh, then if it is, how do you produce hydrogen cheaply? Can we look at geothermal on the Big Island? Can this state produce 
hydrogen in, 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 in a quantity and at a cost using geothermal that is viable. I don't know the answer but to that. But you're looking at it. Well, I think we all should look at yeah. it. And if things come to us, yeah. you know, I, I, we are kind of like a reactive agency, uh, Jay and, and Sharon, because we wait for dockets to come. Do you have to? I mean, can you wake up one morning, can you collectively, the commissioners, wake up one morning and say, you know, we're missing something. We're going to open a docket ourselves. We can. We're going to require you know, people to come to us and, and, and answer we questions can. about this. We can. And we're going to take action on our own initiative. Yeah. We, we can. We can open an investigative docket. Um, and um, I mean, we, we, we did that when, uh, for example, when uh, HECO shut down uh, the contract with Sun Edison. Um, we wanted to know why you were so quick in shutting it down and taking away from the people on this island, 112 megawatts of uh, uh, solar energy. Mm -hmm. After we had gone through years uh, of uh, review, and now we're left with uh, only one uh, uh, solar utility scale solar project in Waianae. We had four. We started with eight, or maybe more than that. And it was called down to eight and then four. And so we did open that up. And, and, and that's what it was telling people, look, we are going to be active. We are going to be aggressive. What we cannot do, like I said, though, is um, commit to a certain kind of, of technology which may come to us in a docket, and then we'd have to make decisions on it. Yeah. You know, is, is it cost effective? Yeah. Uh, where is it located? Um, and stuff like that. Who's going to run it? Yeah. State of mind. It's a, a state of, it's a philosophy I think you're talking about. Um, and I certainly agree about the platform. In fact, that's what ThinkTech is. It's a platform. And the thing about our platform that may differ from your platform is that every 15 minutes we take a break. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a commercial break. Uh. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on ThinkTech Hawaii. I hope you'll join me each Friday afternoon as we explore the amazing world of science. We bring on interesting guests, scientists from all walks of life, from all walks of science, to talk about the work they do, why they do it, and moreover, why it's interesting to you. What the science really means to your life, its impacts on you, how it's shaping the world around you, and why you should care about it. I do hope you'll join me every Friday at 2 p.m. for Lakeable Science. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September, and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Okay, yeah. we're back with Randy Iwashi, the chair of the PUC, a man who's had a tremendous amount of experience with Hawaii state government, uh, and a man who knows uh, how to make decisions, I would say. That's a compliment, yeah. Oh, thank you. We need that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good. We need that. This is what happened, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing people ask about the PUC, why does it take so long to actually make the decision? Why did it take uh, you know, so long on Next Era? Why did it take so long on these other things, too? I mean, it's, 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 this goes back 100 years. Um, but can, is there anything we can do to speed the process? Uh, well, you know, we're trying. Um, and in, uh, the more direct answer to your question is it depends on the case. Uh, some cases are very complex. We also do, for example, motor carriers, uh, applications for certificate of, uh, for certi certification. Uh, we try to get those out quickly. Um, so what we can do quickly, we're doing. The other thing is, um, was the staffing. When I came on board, like I said, in, in 2015, we had 32 people and the four dockets. And uh, we had not heard of McNextera then, but uh, we, would have, we would have really had a, a, a trouble swimming if we had only 32 people and Nextera uh, uh, before us. Uh, with respect to Nextera, that was a very complex case. I think it fell within a range of, of other cases on the main. Some did it quicker than us. Others did it about the length of time we did. Um, we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, because of the magnitude of the case and the interest in the public, we wanted to make sure that at the very least the public would have a feeling that they could make a statement to us. So we did uh, a listening session. We went to eight, all eight islands. I wanted to make sure we did that. And we did do that. 
And then the hearing itself, um, we had no control over the timing because the lawyers, we did not want to disrupt or get accused of denying them the opportunity and your lawyer to examine or cross-examine a witness. And, you know, it took 22 days, uh, much longer than we thought it would. We tried to structure the process where we could go through rounds of questionings quicker, and we did. I think if we had not uh, devised that process, which was really Tom Gorak's idea, we probably uh, would have um, extended the, the number of days to 22. Then we had, um, and Henry Curtis, you know, Henry, Henry does his blogs, and um, he, he, he actually, I don't know what he was doing, but he counted pages. And so <laughs> he said it was like over 100,000 pages of documents. So I'm going to take him at his word, because I'm not going to count the number of pages. Fair <laughs> Thank <enough>. you, Henry. <laughs> so, uh, um, um, and so that was there. Uh, there was just reams of paper, reams of testimony that had to be read. Uh, we had a docket team, a very good docket team that, that took the time to uh, review. And it came out to over 400 pages. 265 for the substantive decision, but we added other things, like the guidance. So It's a good thing you're a lawyer, no kidding, because as the chair, you were able to do this in a legal fashion and um, you know, c keep control of the proceedings. It would have been easy to lose control, and you didn't. It was good with your all the interveners that came in that you were able to manage it. That was like some task yeah, just yeah. to you know, well, manage that. You know? Yeah, like I said, we had a process where we had rounds of questions. And it was a process that Tom Gorak uh, developed, and it worked. And I think uh, what happened was the first round, everybody was charged up. It was like the, the, the first quarter of a football game. And the first, the first plays mm -hmm. from the foot, everybody's charged up. And they were just going at it. And we went like three or four rounds. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of the process, people ask less questions. Mm -hmm. And so, tired. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. And, and Last so, person standing. <laughs> it, it moved. It moved faster. Um, but it 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 was a process that had we not had Tom not come up with it, uh, and we not applied it, um, uh, it would have been a longer hearing process. Because, like I said, the one thing uh, there was something that told, I was told a long time ago. Uh, I believe it was an attorney named Ben Matsubara, who was a hearings officer, and he said. When you do hearings, don't get reversed on procedure. If you're going to get reversed, get reversed on substance. Yeah. So we wanted to make sure that procedurally we gave the parties all the opportunity they needed or wanted um, so that they could feel like all the questions that they asked were asked. And they have confidence in the system. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. It's really important. That's it. The uh, trust in the process and, you know, how yeah, it comes yeah. about. Yeah. On Tom Gorak, how do you feel about his appointment? I, f I feel very good about it. Um, yeah. You know, Tom, um, I said it yesterday. At, uh, Tom, I did not know Tom Gorak when I came to the commission. Uh, I was, had been retired for eight years. But, you know, uh, I've, I've seen people working for government. I know good people. I know people who are committed, who work hard filled with integrity and care about the agency and, 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 its, and its reputation. He's all of that. Uh, he brings with him a wealth of experience um, from both the private sector, because he, uh, he had represented private utility companies. He was a consumer advocate and um, was, on the, was here actually to retire until my predecessor, Mina, called him out, back, called him back to the, the commission. And he's been invaluable. Um, from a legal standpoint, and, and this other th the other thing is, having been where he was, there is a difference between knowing utility industry, the field, and knowing how to regulate, how to be a regulator, how to be a decision maker, because that's a very different perspective you, bring, you have to have. Um, you're not there to second guess the utility company. You're not there to say, if I were chair or president of Hawaiian Electric, I would do this. Your job is to say, this is the law, this is what we have to do, have you done it, and then make the call. You know, that's, that's actually more important going forward. I mean, as we go forward, uh, let's assume for a moment there's another opportunity, another suitor for Hawaiian Electric, and people express the view as, uh, well, you know, uh, we may not be able to control this company uh, for some one reason or another because, um, you know, they're from offshore, whatever it is. 
But if the if the Public Utility Commission takes control of the situation, the public and I and I, I feel that you have a special view of this. Uh, that the Public Utility Commission can regulate and can deal with you know any suitor. Um, isn't it true? You can you can apply the kind of regulatory philosophy and activism, if I can use that term, so as to control the situation, no matter what. Am I right? Well, I, well, that's what that's my view. Um, that's why I say, uh, first of all, we can control the process for a merger acquisition, as we did with Nextera. But that's why I started off uh, today and and the, uh, yesterday by saying, the merger case was just had the notoriety. Everybody was excited mm -hmm. about the the. Um, the merger case, but to me, more important than who was what that mm -hmm. company would be doing going forward. Mm -hmm. And those four dockets would set the parameters, uh, set the pathway, not parameters, because I, I, there's really not none uh, as we evolve, but the pathways. And to tell them that's what you will be doing. That's, what, that's the thing with the guidance. We are telling them uh, things like you have to tell us that you're not going to impact uh, the competitive bidding in Hawaii. You're not going to, we're a small state. You have to tell us how you're going to meet the clean energy goals when you make your filings. Something which was not true in the next tariff filings. It was all maybe, uh, no guarantees. Uh, we'll do it after the merger is completed. Tell us how you're going to meet the clean energy goals. You tell us all of these things so we can then look at you and make a determination whether or not you fit Hawaii. And when I say that, I want to make this clear. It's not about being just local. That it's so easy to say, well, they got denied because they're from the mainland. That's not the case. The case was, can you provide us the information to tell, so that we feel comfortable that if you take over this company, you understand that this is a unique company, given where we are in the Pacific Ocean that given our culture, there are unique expectations from the people of this company. And finally, yes, you have the money. What are you going to do with it to meet those things? Um, when we talk about com competition, for example, small place, one, one big guy can take it all over. And we didn't want that. We want to make sure that the comp there'll be competition for solar panels, for PVs, for wind energy, for geothermal, you're not going to rule it all. That we in this state, in our inclinations, do not want a top-down, one monopoly controlling everything. That's, that we've made clear. Yeah. And um, those things were not met in this case, for us at least. Yeah. You know, one thing occurs to me is that you have two really very different utilities that you're uh, regulating. Uh, one is Hawaiian Electric as a, you know, the classical model. The other is KIC. Is there a difference in the way you approach that? Is there a difference in the way you regulate them and have that conversation with them? No, not in terms of the law, no. We, the, the same law applies to both. Uh, and KIUC has certain advantages that uh, HECO, uh, and I would use that for all three of the companies, does not have. KIUC is small. It's got like, what, 80,000, 60,000 people on the island. Yeah. You, when you did the NEM program, you didn't see this massive wave of people come charging out of, of the house and put, a, put, a, put something on my roof, <laughs> unlike Maui. And, um, and, so, and they're a cooperative, uh, which means that they're all in. When they make a decision, it's not a board of directors and shareholders. It's everybody on that island is going to be affected by that decision. And so um, what I found for them, because they're smaller, uh, and it doesn't mean it can't be transferred over or make analogies to what HECO can do. Mm -hmm. They're quicker. They bec uh, Dave Bissell and his crew appear to be much more innovative, uh, much more willing to try. Uh, they have now uh, uh, a solar pr project with, with uh, uh, batteries, which I hope will happen here because batteries is part of the future for us. HECO is bigger. Um, and I'm going to look at just Oahu. Because Maui and even the Maui and the Big Island are a bit different because of the population side. We have a whole lot of people here. We had a whole lot of people that put uh, uh, PVs on. Maui did too. And, and so you have issues that affecting the grid um, that we have to deal with. But we hope that um, uh, without any, 
any feeling on their part of being pressured that maybe they look at their their smaller uh, company on Kauai and maybe take some ad advantage or take some advice on what they're doing. Uh, look at what they're doing. Um, when you talk about how we deal with them, if, I said this yesterday too, <clears throat> if there is a good project, they've submitted things to us that are all in order. The information is there, the analysis is there uh, for us to make a determination. We want to try and get those decisions out. And we, we've done a couple of with, with Kauai uh, utilities. Some are still sitting because they want to be different from uh, uh, the, big, the big utility. And we're, we're trying to say, no, you, you got to still fall under the same law. But um, uh, we're not going to treat them differently. But we try to encourage uh, the innovation and the willingness to try that KI, Dave Bissell and his crew seem to be pursuing. Yeah. So um, on, on the personal side, your term expires in 2020. It gives you four good years. Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah. 2020 it gives you four good years to change the world. Um, you're going to want another one? Is this your, you know, this is the capstone, you know, isn't it? Isn't this is a great opportunity. <laughs> I told you this when I saw you in the legislature <laughs> after you'd been appointed. This is a great capstone for your career after all that you've done. But will you go further? Will you want another term? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think so. I'll be um, um, older than Sharon <laughs> um, <laughs> in, in 2020. I'll be 73 years old. Yeah. And uh, you know what is it? What's the judge retirement age? 70. 70. Hey, if it's good enough for a judge to leave at 70, <laughs> Fair enough. it's good enough for me. And um, I, I, I came back for a purpose. And I'll, I hope, my hope is that whenever I leave. Um, that I can look back and say we did something positive to move this thing along because that's why I came back. Um, when we're our age, uh, I think we have a responsibility to look at the future and the kids and, and leave a better place. And when I left um, politics in 2000, well, I didn't, I left politics, yeah, I didn't leave. I left it in 2000 and then I was doing the Labor Appeals Board. But in 2000, I, I don't know if I could say that about what, you know, I can look back on my career, 10 years in the Senate, two, uh, two years in the council, all this stuff. I, other than looking at Central Oil Regional Park and the Aloha Tower project, uh, which I can show my grandkids, that's, that's not something I, you can really say, all right, that, I made my mark. This is different. Yeah, this, this is, is different. This is yes, good. Yeah. It's good yeah. stuff. So, how do you want to how do you want to leave the uh, PUC? I mean, how do you see it evolving between now, 2016, and, and 2020? What is your vision for the PUC, its influence, its its place, its role in the clean energy initiative? Well, again, we are the regulatory body, and when I came on board, uh, you, that's why you don't see as much at the legislature. I know, I believe my predecessor went in and testified on policy issues. I believe the administration should speak with one voice, and that's the governor through his energy office. And so we backed off the policy. We've de dealt with anything you affect us procedurally, we'll talk about it. But from the regulatory standpoint, is to build that staff. Um, I want, we, we've increased the salaries. I go back to staffing, because it's all important. Build, we've increased the salary. Hopefully, there'll be some means for them to, to get promoted so that uh, in, they'll stay for 10 years or they stay for 20 years because you need that experience, like Tom brought to the commission and still brings to the commission. And um, to um, be as aggressive in, in the pursuit of the policy that the commission was when it issued the inclination paper. And then now it's the implementation, por implementation portion we're pushing uh, we're getting the stakeholders involved. We want, um, we want this implemented so that by 2045, I think it's 2045, wasn't it? 2045. Yeah, 100%. 100% yeah. will be reached. And, um, and don't take your, f your, your foot off the gas pedal. Just keep it on. That's, a, that's an interesting reference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, electric, electric, <laughs> electric. Uh, the golf cart, electric, electric golf carts. Thank you for pointing that so out. So you mentioned staff and you mentioned space. I mean, do you need more? Do you need more yeah. uh, resources? Do you need the legislature to provide you more? 
Um, <clears throat> do you need, um, you know, more uh, legislative structure? Like, for example, an energy authority, any, any notion about that? Uh, how do you see the, you know, the, the governmental um, infrastructure uh, question in the next four years? Well, from a, the legislature recognized, I think the year before I came on board, uh, the needs of the PUC. So they, they passed allowing restructuring, allowing the hiring more quickly. And Governor Ige, when he came in, he just signed right off, giving me the authority to go hire. And so, we, like I said, we went from 32 to 55 in a year and a half. Um, yeah, we need more space. We're being, there is a renovation project going on. Uh, we have separated the agency, so now our research policy group is, is next to the district court. We'll all come back together about 2018. Um, so that's the first thing. Second, I know there was always, there was this um, discussion about a PUC that is separate with one looking at energy and one looking at everything else. Um, I haven't made my mind up on that. I, I remember talking to uh, uh, Governor Abercrombie when he was governor, and I believe Governor Ige, um, saying, I don't know if we need to do that right now. Um, and, and so I'd have to look at it, because you'd create two new bu bu mm -hmm. bureaucracies, mm -hmm. yeah. and we don't, we don't want to do that if it's not necessary. Right now, uh, we're handling what we've got to handle, and who knows what's uh, going to happen in, in five years or four years. Maybe they'll change. But again, the, the operative word in politics, as it is for the utility field, is uh, e evolution. Yeah. We've got to keep our eyes open, our ears open, and, and see what we got to do to get where we got to go to. We agree absolutely. And we, uh, we think that this is a, a moving target at all times. Uh, things happen, things change, things you expect it, you want it almost because you want to stay current. And we want to stay current with you. We'd like you to come back and talk to us from time to time. I hope that's okay. Sure. This yeah, has been great. very good. And, yeah. and, you know, translating what you're doing there, because you see all the legal, the orders that come out, the, the public doesn't really understand that. So how you've explained it today is, is terrific. So please come well, back. Well, you know what I tell my and it's because of me. I mean, I see all this gobbledygook called uh, acronyms from the utility <laughs> field. You know, and I, 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 I was getting lost, and so I had to. But I tell my, I, I, my office look, overlooks the bus stop uh, on Punchbowl. And when my staff comes in and tells me, you know, RSPSIP, I tell them, stop. <laughs> you see that guy at the bus stop? You see that woman at the bus stop? Talk to me like you talk, you talk to them so that they would understand. If they understand, I'll understand. Absolutely. And that's, that's, uh, that's what um, I hope we, we're going to do. And, and, and finally, as we, I know you guys don't have much time, but there has to be a, an outreach to the community to get them involved because we don't have the, the uh, buy-in yet, I think, that we can with renters, people in condominiums uh, who cannot participate in PVs. And so we're going to push the community-based renewable energy program. We're going to push the time of use program. Because I think people want to participate in energy sustainability. They understand about climate change, even if a certain members of a certain political party do not. But they do. <laughs> and uh, they see it. They see it. And we're going to, we're going to try to reach out. Good. Great. Sharon, you got to close. Your turn. <laughs> okay. I'm really pleased that you came to join us, Chair Iwase, um, and telling us all that you're doing because it really is important, as you say, bringing the community forward and, and understanding what you do is so important. And uh, we hope we can be part of that and helping you get the word out and getting more people to understand the gobbledygook to make sure that, the, that, it, they are, that you are working for our best interests and the interests of the public. Thank, Thank you. you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.